before we start, welcome to the Super Friends and, and everyone who's here. I wanted to just take a moment to acknowledge the, the anguish and trauma that is happening in our country today, specifically surrounding the recent deaths of uh, Amand Arbery, uh, Brianna Taylor, and George Floyd. And we send, uh, we would love for us to just take in a moment of several breaths and a moment of silence for the anguish and loss experienced by their friends, their family, and their communities. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and, and as we continue to do this, this important work as, as artists and as writers to document what is happening in the world and how to process and how to put down into words the, the, the myriad of emotions and feelings, I hope that this conversation today, especially with Martin, who I really admire and respect, not only as just as a writer, but as a friend. So I'm really happy to have Martin here. Thank you so much. Um, what, what we're gonna do today is actually just basically talk. And just ha I'm just gonna start out by uh, asking just a few questions to just kind of get us, uh, I don't know, lubricated <laughs> in terms of talking <laughs> about writing. Um, and then I, I wanna be able to give as much time to our participants to, to ask you anything about, your process, working in the industry, how you got started, what inspires you, uh, what's getting you through the day, uh, uh, you know, with everything that's happening in the pandemic. Um, but I, I would just love for you to, to, to talk a little bit about uh, maybe just like a few things about like your biography, like where, where did you grow up and how did you get inspired to become a writer? Uh, I grew up uh, outside of DC, um, Maryland. Uh, my mother is from Argentina. Um, as probably some of you could glean uh, from my hat. Um, and uh, how did I, I don't know how I got into being uh, a writer. I mean, obviously I grew up in, in, in a, a bilingual home. I grew up, as we were talking before the call, like I went to Saturday school, the Escuela Argentina de Washington, as they call it. So I, you know, I learned Spanish from a very early age and um, I've always been really, I don't know, I've always been drawn to like enacting things. Like as a kid, I, when I, we would watch movies with my family, I would inevitably, I would like gather these props next to the, the, the TV and I would start enacting the movie alongside it, which would cause my dad to like fellow at me that like, I wasn't one, the one being paid to talk, so I should stop distracting everyone. So I guess I feel like part of that impulse to like constantly be trying to like inhabit things in my body probably naturally drew me to uh, theater and, and obviously started acting, but very late in high school. And then in college, I, I really sort of dove in. Um, and from there, I, I started writing, sort of dabbling in different kinds of writing. At first, I thought maybe I would take a screenwriting class. And then someone, I was already, I already knew I was going to study theater. Uh, and I was primarily focusing in acting at that point, although you, you did a little of everything um, in my undergrad. And um, a friend of mine was like, no, 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 the real writing is in playwriting. The real writers are playwrights. So I took a playwriting <laughs> class and then it just sort of took off from there. I, I, I wrote a bunch of plays in undergrad. I was always writing and I was very fortunate to have, I think, a one act and two full length plays of mine produced, you know, in, in, in whatever form you can as an undergrad with other undergrads, but had that done. And then I went from there to grad school and sort of, I guess I just sort of got sucked into that tunnel. Um, but I do think that that, I tell the story about like, who I was as a kid enacting movies alongside the TV, I think as, as a, I think there was always that need in me to try and sort of understand things by trying to sort of inhabit uh, other roles. Right. Um, so uh, there's some folks here who are thinking or want 
usually ask the opinion of like whether they should go to school for playwriting or not. Or you went to you went to UT Austin. Did yeah. you know that that's that was uh, a program that you wanted to go to, or were you applying to different places? And did you get? And what do you tell younger folks who are who are possibly interested in in pursuing yeah. a, a career in writing? Um, I don't think it's a necessity at all. Mm -hmm. I think you have to go like for everyone, I think it's for, you have to go for certain reasons. Um, I went because uh, I, you know, when I was in undergrad, uh, my, my faculty mentors had told me that they thought it would be a good idea, but to go to, um, to have writing time to go, if you, I wasn't going to go into debt, I didn't at all at UT at the time. I don't know. If the, I don't know what the funding situation is like now, obviously, because there had since there have since been budget cuts. Um, but I, I didn't go into any debt. I wanted to have writing time. Um, I went and got some contacts, but really I, I, I learned a ton too. So I think like, it depends on, it's obviously always a trade-off about like where you are in life, what you need to sacrifice in order to go to school versus what you're looking to get out of it. And I think that, I just think you have to be very conscious about that. Um, I personally would not have gone at it meant going into more debt to go to school. And so I was fortunate to not have to. But there are so many ways to learn to to write and you don't have to necessarily go to school. If you want to end up teaching it at a university level, I think mean, that's another reason I, I to me teaching experience was valuable and the idea of getting into the classroom was very uh, valuable. And so there are certain doors uh, that it opened for me um, by having an MFA, but there are also other doors that I've been able to open that I, I I think having an MFA helped me from the education standpoint of like having had the time to study and write on my own that you can do in other ways. And I didn't need the, the accreditation of the MFA to get those doors mm -hmm. open, so. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so my third question is related to, to, being, to being Latino and, and, and you having a significant footprint in not only just working in uh, dramas that are based in, in Latin America, but also working on a, a show like Ozark, which is fascinating to me. What, what do you think you bring to the writers' rooms in, in, in those, in, in those um, television series, those diff very different worlds of Ozark and Narcos? And I think you're working on something now again in, in Argentina, but um, yeah. if you could talk a little bit about like growing up biculturally, bilingually, what, what, what did that, what does that bring to, what do you bring with that in terms of the process? Yeah, it, uh, so the, the show that I've been working on in, in Argentina, just so people know, that came out, the first season premiered in February, is called Puerta Siete, and it's set inside the world of Argentine professional soccer and sort of organized crime associated with a lot of clubs in Argentina. Um, and, and so that's a very different process, obviously, from like Ozark or Narcos. Narcos, when I started on that show, I was the only... Uh, when I started was the only uh, Spanish speaking writer. And then obviously, you know, there were obviously other other creative uh, voices on the show who weren't writers who were Spanish speaking or who lived in Colombia or um, lived in, in Los Angeles, but were uh, Mexicano. And um, so there, you know, but when I started, obviously there was a very valuable uh, standpoint of being a show that is based based on reality. And, and being the only one who could access so much material that was only in Spanish. So there was that, that uh, uh, was very valuable. Um, you know, from, uh, on a show like Ozark, it's obviously very different, but uh, the, the concept of where the show sits, not just geographically, but in terms of like, who are the protagonists of the show. But I do think that it's really um, one of the, the, the points of view of the show that I think is really valuable and, and, and that all of the writers hold very dear is the idea of uh, how the line between legitimacy, quote unquote, and, and institutions that we don't view as legitimate is actually quite blurry. And so I think that that like always trying to, to be a voice that, uh, that holds that very near and dear that like how our society decides what is legitimate and not, uh, what defines that. Um, and why why do we make those decisions? And, and also, I think just like trying to um, obviously, it also is a cross cultural show, it, um, and and trying to like understand like where are the sort of the the different assumptions 
that characters from different cultures bring into that that world and like what can uh the protagonists do for their bosses right and they their bosses know that only the protagonists can do because of because of where they sit culturally and uh, so that that's like a, a big thing that obviously that i can bring and everyone is aware of but also like um knowing what are certain assumptions that that uh latino characters bring into the show can be really useful um and the show puerta siete i think is um and I would say that what I can bring to Puerta Siete is also what I think I can bring to all of these shows, which when you speak about being bicultural, it, it is, it, 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 my experience of it in childhood is almost like I belonged nowhere. And so like I was never in the insider anywhere because uh, I feel like everyone saw what I wasn't rather than what I was. And in fact, like one of the, one of the trips uh, I made to Argentina to do, you know, production for Puerta Siete, I actually had, uh, like, I was having coffee with with two other people, and I literally watched them argue in front of me whether I was Argentino or Estadounidense, because they were like, well, I mean, he was born in Estados Unidos, but he speaks so much like an Argentino. If you walked around here, you wouldn't think that he was an Argentino, but it's really... And so, like, to me, that was very emblematic of, like, oh, what, like, it, everywhere you are, my experience is that people tell me like, you're not this. So then I think it's benefited me in some ways as a writer, because I feel like a, it's useful for a writer to feel like an outsider, because I think that you don't take anything for granted. I think that like sometimes writing can get very um, general and vague when you don't realize what your audience doesn't know. Right. Mm -hmm. When you don't real because you, you're just like, oh, well, this is just the way things work. And you're not even aware of like the various assumptions that you, that cultural assumptions that your characters are moving through and that you need to communicate that to an audience. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially if they're an audience, it's not like you. And I would say that, like, everywhere I go, everyone is not like me <laughs> in that sense. I think that's my primary experience of life is that, like, I right. am never in a place where everyone is like me ever, ever. Um, right. And do you use those cultural assumptions in the writing to kind of explain it to the audience, like a general audience? Yeah. I mean, I think that like, um, so like an example of something. So I think with Puerta Siete, it's also those are two writers who, you know, are born in Argentina, lived in Argentina their whole lives. And it's a show that obviously is for Argentina, but also can be for a global audience. And so one of the things we're constantly talking about is like, they'll discuss something and I'll be like, wait, what is that thing? And they'll be like, yeah, yeah, you know, they do they do this thing, but in the stadium. And I'm like, yeah, but what is, why? And they're like, I don't know, they just do it. And I'm like, but that's, you know, that's not like, no one else does that anywhere else in the world. So like, let's let's highlight that because that's like weird and interesting. And like, people would be like, what are they doing? Um, so they're constantly are like, what do we have to do to sort of slow the pace of how certain bits of information are unfurled so that people can process them? Right, because if they're if you're watching a story from outside of a culture, if if uh, if you sort of like throw all of all of the, the sort of rituals of that culture at, at an outside audience at once, people can't process it. Whereas if you like piece it out piece by piece, then people can be like, oh yeah, now I have been initiated in this ritual. Great, and obviously so much about soccer is ritual so it's like i've been initiated in this ritual now i don't need to i can i can i can receive that ritual alongside this other ritual the next time so those are the conversations that i have on that show um like an example of another another conversation i had writing on a different project was talking about like retirement because they were like well when this person retires and i remember being like this person's never going to retire retirement isn't in their vocabulary like that's not a thing they're gonna they know they're gonna work until the end and it was like a big sort of like mind-blowing moment for my collaborators on that project like oh mm -hmm. it's like yeah it's not that's not an assumption that anyone has uh certainly in a lot of people in argentina they don't have that assumption and i assume in many other countries in latin america that that many workers just have the assumption that like this is this will be the rhythm of my life there's not this is not a station in my life that I will move through. This is not a phase, this is my life. And so that was just like an example of the different assumptions that I try to, I try to illuminate when in, when in collaboration with people. And I think it, it can be really useful to, you can be quite explicit sometimes about highlighting the different assumptions people 
have different characters have. Right, and and, and it's fascinating because I I sometimes think about how what, what who my what my audience is because I think I, I see your that having like just having the the theme of football, soccer, <laughs> at, well, yeah. you, know, you have a billion. <laughs> Yeah, like this is the most popular sport. So everybody has sort of a shared language about that. And then you have the Netflix, the brand, which is very global. And how do you, how do you, uh, I'm curious, how do you um, think about writing for, like, how do you think about an audience like that when it's like the whole world? <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's, it's, they're very different for me. Like I'm writing a play right now that's set in San Diego. And I know that, I'm immersing myself in that world from my childhood. I, I'm not really thinking about like what somebody in Taiwan or somebody in Argentina might think of it, but but I wonder if like does it does it change how what you what the semiotics are, what you convey in the. In, in terms of I think it ch it does change the rhythm of it a little bit. It does change mm -hmm. how you have to highlight certain things, and then so that's on one level, and I think that you know. Having collaborators, that's like incredibly helpful. I think in many ways, it's like really helpful to have collaborators. It's one of the things I love about television, but obviously you can do this in theater as well. And I think, you know, I think probably one of the things that attracts me to TV that I've brought from theater is collaboration. And a lot of writers who don't come from theater like freak out about it, um, it's, it's difficult for them. Um, but I think that having collaborators who don't have the same experiences as you, and obviously like as a, a Latinx community, like we are so diverse and we bring so many different uh, cultural assumptions. And yet also as a Latinx community within the United States, there is a sort of shared experience of what does it mean to have roots from elsewhere? And obviously like shared cer certain parts of shared history and shared language too that are really helpful. And so that's like really exciting about having collaborators. You both have like uh, a foot in the same experience and then like often a foot outside. Of it. And that can be really helpful to have someone pause you and be like, I don't understand that thing. Maybe we need to highlight that, right? So that like having good collaborators who uh, will, will sort of point things out to you where they don't understand is really valuable. On the other hand, I feel like, uh, how do you speak to an audience? It's the same way that like, it's just the same the same storytelling principles of, of like character, making people invest in the characters, love them, um, making the sort of internal contradictions of those, of those characters very present, their internal conflict, their pain, what they're longing for, uh, you know, because people, the other thing that, that I, I've learned uh, through working on shows that are, that are uh, you know, uh, broadcast around the world is that people will really jump on board a ship where they don't understand a vast majority of what's happening if they really like the characters. Like they will go with it, they'll figure it out. So you, you may think like, oh, I have to explain that thing. And honestly, the viewers will be like, no, no, no it's just that we skipped that scene because the, this guy wants that. And then so, and they don't care as long as they're like, they feel that sort of core connection, that heart connection with the characters. Mm -hmm. Um, that's great. Uh, I, I will share like this little tidbit that my, my grandmother's favorite movie that was that she would always stop and watch, uh, and she didn't speak English. She, she loved the movie Predator <laughs> <laughs> because A, it takes place in, in like in the jungles of South America and B, like that, that's a movie that doesn't need like, that's not driven by, by something linguistic, right? It's not like a character drama the drama is in the situation and in the people and if you can tell that story visually yes it's it's compelling it's so compelling and i just found it hilarious that she loved arnold schwarzenegger and <laughs> yeah my, my mom <laughs> loved Predator. arnold schwarzenegger movies too I, I, and she also loved the movie alien she loved that yeah movie. she was obsessed with that movie i mean but there's like that like beautiful like and there's a kind of like brechtian I was, I was going to say Brechtian alienation. I mean, no, no pun intended, but like the idea of like, what does it mean to feel like a person she, you know, lives in a, in a world, in a country that she feels like she doesn't belong to. And so like, what does it feel, you know, like to see it projected in these non-human terms of like, what does it mean to right. feel like you're this collision of different, uh, you know, 
cultures in a way, obviously. And then like, what does it yeah. mean to sort of the, the dislocation of that? Right. Well, I, I don't want to hog all the, the time with you, even though I'd love to, but I, I want to open it up to folks to ask you questions about, uh, you know, your writing, your process, what inspires you and all that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, let's see where this goes. Let's welcome everyone into the Zoom. Hello, hello, yeah. Everybody, if you're, you're more than welcome to turn on your video if you would like to join the conversation. Uh, if you have a question for Martin, go ahead and uh, use the raise hand button. You can find that at the bottom of your screen. Hit the participants button. Uh, it should come up as a little blue hand. If it does not, there should be a little dot, dot, dot off to the side and it'll be there. And as a last resort, you can always toss it in the chat. Our first question is from Danny Borba. You are unmuted. Hi. Um... So I think you you said that you started off as an actor, um, and I think I I'm st um, studying to be an actor right now. Um, but because of Tlaloc and Theo's like uh, these little discussions, uh, super amigos, like I'm seeing my up my inner writer being uprooted. Um, but sometimes I feel like my actor brain is still present while I'm writing, and I wanted to know like what do you ever as a writer like right in the perspective of the actor or knowing that since you were like an actor, are there some advantages that you see from that or, or disadvantages and things that you have to look out for? Um, but yeah, that's my question. Yeah, I think that I, absolutely. I mean, now I, you know, I haven't acted since undergrad, but I, I do think I carry a lot of my training that I received as an actor into my writing. I think like I probably talk my scenes aloud if you filmed me, right? Like I would be saying them out loud. I think a lot of writers do that. I think you'll find that a lot of playwrights started out as actors. I think there's something really valuable about like having to memorize the words of other good writers and really like have them get them into your body. I think that like that, that sits with you uh, and, and it, you can carry it into your writing. And I, in terms of like how I, I use it in my writing consciously, other than just the ways that it's sort of built as an unconsciously, is um, thinking about like what is playable, right? Like what, 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 what kind of scene, what kind of language would give an actor that charge that really like bring in a new energy to a scene and, and bring that sort of physical charge that will, that will really electrify a space and make an audience, especially a live audience, uh, lean in, you know, I, I think in, in terms of TV, I, it, you have the benefit if you are lucky to work on a show continuously for a long time of seeing what an actor can do in that role. And then you sort of like learn what they're really good at. And then you, you write towards that and you, you, and that maybe helps you honestly, uh, write less in a lot of ways, right? Like a lot of the discussions, that I have in, in TV rooms are like, yeah, that really long scene actually, like if you cut it in half, the actor is gonna convey everything that you were writing because we've seen that. And so, you know, I think that that trust is a little easier when you work with the same actor in the same role for a long time. But I do think that that, you know, uh, I think hopefully, at, you know, acting training can also help you understand like, where do you give the space for the actor to act? Right, so that you're not you're not overwriting everything. You're not trying to do everything in the text. So much of the electricity of a play lives in those spaces between the lines, in the space between the actors. And so, where you know, I think my training as an actor also helped me understand that too. All right, thank you. Wonderful. Our next question is from Stephanie's iPad. Stephanie's iPad, you are unmuted. Hi, I'm Stephanie's iPad. Um, um, I'm also from Argentina and I came here from a very young age um, and as a light-skinned Latina it's really hard to belong so I totally get you uh, um, but my question is about your trajectory your process from um, grad school to writing for theater, to getting into those coveted spots at Netflix and then pitching your own show, which is incredible and getting it made. So what were some challenges? What were some things that maybe you would tell yourself now knowing everything you know? Um, if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I mean, what would I say? I mean, I, I think I, I've been very fortunate in many ways. And I think that um, 
So, I mean, like I got into, to, you know, I, I, after, um, after grad school, I was able to, obviously I, I had like a, a side job that I continued working. I had two side jobs, actually. I taught test prep and then I taught, and then I gave Spanish language tours of Chicago. Um, and I would do those while I would write, but like to me, creating a, a structure in my life where I had the ability to write uh, while doing those other things was very important. And I think that, um, I, so that is a piece of advice that I would have. I mean, I, I did like a couple of years of different fellowships that I got out of graduate school that I was very lucky to get. And then from there, I kind of went into TV, not of course being my first job. And it wasn't like a thing that I was really, really heavily pursuing. I know a lot of, uh, you know, and I, I say that I was very fortunate because a lot of people, it's a thing that like they, they really, uh, you know, shift their life to try to pursue it and they knock on that door for a long time before it comes open. Um, I guess the only thing I could say is to try and do everything you can when the opportunity comes to be ready to seize that opportunity. And that would be to like, what can you control? You can control practicing your craft, right? That's the thing that we as writers can always do, which I feel so fortunate about is that nobody can, the only one who can stop you from writing is you. The only one who can stop you from writing is you and, and from watching things, right? Even if you, even in the, the midst of a quarantine, right? You can, you can watch content, whether it's theater, whether it's TV, whether it's movies online, and you can watch them intentionally, like with intention. You can journal about them. I journal, uh, I try to journal every day. So I'm thinking, I'm reflecting constantly about what I'm seeing, what I can pull from it, what I can learn, what I can carry forward from that experience. If I'm reading a book, I'll write down little quotes from it. And I have like a, you know, on like a little uh, journal, uh, digital journal, I guess, and I'll tag it so that they're just like little things that I can use little bits of inspiration. So I think those are the things that you can take care of. I can't, I mean, I have been lucky. I think that I've gotten a lot of the opportunities I've gotten because I am bilingual, because I am bicultural. I think that, so I can't control that. Like that was a gift that was given to me, but what I can control is when the opportunity comes to me, I can control being able to take the most, uh, to being able to make the most of it. And I think the way that you do that is by making sure that you are writing every day that you're like putting in your time, right? Like, uh, you know, I think that a thing that I had to learn as I got older is like that there's a time to work and there's a time to not, and that the not working can be as valuable as the working, but that like, cause I think if, if you don't set good parameters on your work, you're going to feel guilty about not having worked. And therefore you're always going to be working. So I think like you can clock in. Um, and I think Glaluk, you and I talked a little bit about the, the, the Pomodoro technique. I don't know if, um, but this is probably a good time to talk about that, which is uh, a technique. Um, yeah. Where you, you literally, you put on a timer and you work interrupted for 25 minutes and you will do nothing but work for 25 minutes. Then you take a five minute break and then you do it again. And like, if you tell yourself, all right, well, you know, I, I have a, I have a day job because I have to make ends meet but I'm gonna make sure that I write for four pomodoros. You can get so much done if you do nothing but work for four 25 minute stretches. And I think just clocking in, like making sure that you're putting in your hours, putting in your time so that, and, 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 and consuming good material uh, uh, intentionally and, and, and reflecting on what it is that you respond to in that material, what it is that you maybe don't respond to so that you have a point of view and that when you have the opportunity to have your play done or you have the opportunity to to work on a TV show, right? Like you, you can, or you have the opportunity to workshop a play, which is a very precious opportunity. You know how to come in there and intentionally make the most of it. Beautiful. Our next question is from Isabel Pask. You are unmuted. Hi, um, I guess uh, our question is about um, being in a writer's room. Uh, we're working on um, kind of writing a series right now and none of us have ever actually fully been in a writer's room. And so, and we're all kind of just coming out of school and working on putting together, we've done like research on different writer's rooms and have a virtual thing going on right now, obviously. But what is your, um, advice kind of in in making a writer's room feel like it's working really well and feel collaborative and like a lot of you know 
feel supportive and also productive. Yeah, oh, that's that's a that's like the the art the art of of trying to uh, you know how like run a collaboration. I think that um, to me the best collaborations, and I think that like uh, Ozark is a great example of a of a of a collaboration like that that works really well. And I, I've tried to bring that into you know the process with the writers of Puerto Siete, and I think we have a really good collaboration to is is making sure that everyone feels valuable and making sure that everyone's contributions feel essential and making sure um, making sure that you can articulate what is essential right in, in your vision and where is the room for people to play once again that I think that's the thing that I learned through the theater right and in, in watching like an actor and and or actors and directors and designers like take your play and run with it and try to understand like what are what are the vital parameters obviously because there are choices that are less useful choices to make than others right but also you want people people are going to bring their best when you let them innovate when you let them bring you something unexpected when you let them surprise you and so like a lot of what i do when we work on Puerta Siete with the other writers is like we're mapping out the story and we'll talk about things together and I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pitch something and they'll be like, yeah, that doesn't really work for these and these reasons. Um, you know, I, I don't think it'll signify the way that you want. And then a lot of what I try to do is articulate, okay, well, this is what we're trying to do. This is what we need to convey, the emotional essence of what we need to convey. Let's find the best and most specific vehicle for that. But, you know, especially in a collaborative series where you have a bunch of different writers who are probably going to be, you know, different writers are going to be writing different scenes or different storylines or uh, different, you know, whole different episodes, right? Like, like we do on Ozark and, and, you know, and what you want to do and what we do as, as a group on that show. And what I also try to bring into my other collaborative processes is a very specific sort of roadmap of how the episode will lay out as a group, like scene by scene, beat by beat. But then also within that, like, throw possibilities at a writer, a bouquet of possibilities, but also let them find and chart their own path through the writing so that they can make discoveries, mm -hmm. right? Like you want, um, someone very wise once said that like, you can't, if a, if a writer doesn't have an experience while writing something, they can't expect the audience to have that experience. Mm -hmm. So if you can't make discoveries while you're writing a thing. If you discover nothing, if you don't surprise yourself, if you don't delight yourself, if you don't make yourself laugh, if you don't make yourself upset and, and heartbroken for your characters, how can you expect anyone else watching it to? You know, and obviously there are gonna be moments where audiences have strong emotional reactions that you didn't have or didn't anticipate because you know, we are as diverse as the number of people as there are in this planet. So they're, you know, they're, uh, but at the same time, you wanna make sure that people have roadmaps as collaborators to work with so that we are all, you know, the whole team is articulating the same vision. Mm -hmm. So you articulate what is essential about a story and about a scene and about a character's path, and then also leave open the writer to try and chart their own course and surprise themselves as they write. Cause that's the, that's the, like the best part for me of the process. Um, even with all the, you know, I think some people love to see the work come to life or, you know, be on the stage and the, the screen. And I think that I, I love all of that and it's very rewarding, but to me, maybe the best part of the process is the sitting down and scratching out a scene for the first time in my notebook and, and being like, oh, there's something cool there that I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't know that I was going to find. So how do you, how do you have a, a shared vision and, a, and preserve the ability for every writer to do that? That's the key. Thank you. It, oh, my we have thing, a question. Oh yeah. Okay, uh, okay. I just want to follow up with that. So, like, so just give me like a picture of you're in a room and you have your ca cafecito and you have your donuts or. I have my mate. mate. I have my mate. And you have your mate, and <laughs> what what is the agenda? Is it like, five, okay, we're gonna like, we're just gonna write for five minutes about anything, and then like a warm up. Do you guys do yoga? Do you like? Do you have a whiteboard? Do you have cards? Like, what is like yeah. a? It, it what, is. What is uh, it for? What do you? What do you? Is it like Dungeons and Dragons? Is it like you know you're like all all doing a thing and and this is like we're creating our own adventure or is it something different? 
<laughs> yeah, it, it is in, in for Ozark. It is you know obviously now we're working we're all working remotely, so the pro the process is different because we found and I I have I in my experience working on Puerta Siete, which is sometimes obviously going to Buenos Aires and talking to other writers, but the vast majority of which is remote, right? So you can't work as long remotely as you could in person because there's just mm -hmm. there's a greater effort in communication. You're also a little more efficient remotely because the like all of the sort of subtle uh, I don't want to say time wasting, but the like the sort of expansion of energy happens physically, right? The subtle like communication, nonverbal communication expands things in a way that isn't there working remotely. But when we are working in person on Ozark, for example, it is, it is, uh, there are like 10 of us in the same room, right? Between the writers and the assistants. And like we sit around a table and for eight hours a day, obviously with like, breaks intermittently but for eight hours a day we we discuss and sometimes argue about storytelling um and and that's what it's like for you know so it, it, it's a it's like you have to feel out and you have to feel like when can i contribute how much you know uh, i have to listen but also i have to think which can be tiring how do you think while you listen you know like there's certain moments where people have to choose to like tune out from the listening because they're trying to think and they'll often write and then they'll come in with the you know come back with the pitch but with the general process for ozark is like we spend about at the top of a season, five weeks mapping out the entire season, then two weeks on an individual episode. And by the time we're done with those two weeks, we have all of the episode mapped out scene by scene on cards on, uh, and that's blended. So we'll start, I'll, I'll take a step back. When we start an episode, we start by thinking of the different storylines, right? For the, the major characters, we'll write them on whiteboards, right? Revise them, revise them. Then once we've got the storylines down, we put them on cards, each scene on a card. Then once we have the cards and we feel like the cards are good, we'll blend the cards, right? After we've blended the cards on like a, a cork board, we walk through the cards one by one, scrutinize them, throw ideas at them, possible dialogue, possible dynamics or energies that the characters could bring into the scene, possible given circumstances. A writer takes that compiled, all of those compiled notes and has you know, uh, three to four days to do a first draft of an outline, like 12 pages, right? And they get two days to turn around notes on an outline. And notes can take a long time. It can be like, on an outline, it can take like four hours. Um, and then, um, so you get used to getting like a lot of notes. A script, you have two weeks to turn around a script. You get notes on that. That can be like four hours, could be six hours of notes. Um, then you get another week to turn around the, that, you know, that draft. And then the showrunner takes a pass. At the script so that's the process for like that's what our day is like in a physical writer's room obviously it's different uh uh you know teleworking um and then for puerta siete like recently obviously the process that we've kind of been would be like we convene to our other writers and i we sort of like talk about life for 30 minutes like how things are how how bizarre uh life is in the quarantine what people are having to do how it's different in chicago versus buenos aires and everything and then like i'll open up a google doc and we'll talk and like i'll write and they'll look at like what i'm like writing down and that and that's basically like the whiteboard it's a digital whiteboard that we'll argue about it and we'll you know and it's, but it's a similar process do everything storyline by storyline then blend it together and then walk through it scene by scene and throw ideas dialogue given circumstances, everything. So that's the general process. But it is cool. like, you know, online for Puerta Siete, it can be like three hours a day, you know? And then, but o Ozark in person is eight hours a day. of like being, imagine it like a big dinner table. It, uh, you eat lunch, obviously, and we take a break around lunch too, but there's tons of food. They say that every writer's room, I haven't been in every writer's room, but every writer's room I've been in had a ton of food and whiteboard. Because people are just like throwing stuff in their mouths and thinking. Um, they say that when wow. you think like that creatively, like you, your brain needs a ton of glucose. So like that, oh that's God. why people are always eating. I, I think I gained 50 pounds just doing that. No, you, but thank really, you, for, you have to be careful. I, mean, I know. But really thank you for painting that. So thank you for painting that picture. I, I want to move on to whoever has the next question. Yeah, how about the snacks? Uh, next que question is from the chat, Jay Paredes. You are unmuted. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, wow, thank you so much. This is 
it, it is really uh, informative to hear kind of what the writing process is. Um, I personally, I come from an acting background and I'm finding that I'm doing a lot of unlearning about like, I never thought of myself as a writer and now I'm starting to kind of open, crack that open a little bit more. I've been in a lot of, um, zoom like playwriting groups where we'll read a play and the, the writer's trying to develop it and i'm just curious i mean you kind of touched on this a little bit but i'm curious if you have any advice on how to be an effective collaborator and maybe specifically from an actor's point of view like what is the most constructive thing that you find an actor can give you as you're developing a play like are there things that are super superfluous or a little distracting or are there other things that are more helpful? I'm just curious about like, what is the most helpful thing for a writer in the development process? Yeah, I would say um, other than obviously just like general rules of like courtesy, like I, I one of the, the uh, like the, the best, ad, on uh, TV sets are slightly different because actors can, you know, like you rehearse everything right before you shoot it. But like the, the some of my favorite collaborators as actors on TV sets often will come up to me and they'll be like, excuse me, I, I, would, I was wondering if I could change the line this way. Uh, and this is the reason, what do you think? And 90% of the time I'll be like, yes, that's great, do it. Um, but like, obviously the culture of theater is different. And I would say first, other than like the rules of courtesy right there, um, mm -hmm. Uh, I think, um, so I think understanding, right, that like as a playwright, the writer can feel completely alone. Like the, to me, the worst feeling as a, as a playwright is when you're workshopping a play and like there's a, a, a puzzle and everyone looks at you and you're the, at the end of the table and you're just like, uh, I'm not sleeping tonight. This is horrible. Um, <laughs> and you're like in previews maybe. So like remembering that the writer's in that situation, A. B, trying right, trying the thing before bringing the question or the concern, right? So like a lot of times I feel like the writer is trying to do a thing. And sometimes what, what frustrates me is like when the thing isn't even tried and then like it generates this long discussion rather than just like, okay, this is a change, dive in. And then if you feel like you're having trouble, um, then talk about it. I think like, asking questions, right? Like leading with questions and, and, and ultimately like articulating if, if something is, is hanging you up as an actor, articulating why. The why is like really important to me, at least as a writer, more than the like what is the why. This is tripping me up because of this thing, because I, I can't, I'm having a hard time bridging from this moment to the next one emotionally, or I don't understand the given circumstances or, you know, and I think also like asking questions is, is another way of, of, of doing, of getting at the why, right? But I think to me, it's like the, the try first and the really try, like the dive in. Sometimes it, uh, uh, my frustration has come with certain actors where you feel like you, they, uh, first of all, they want you to make the change before they've tried. And then second of all, they don't really try when you make the change and then they come back and say like, it's not, you know, so I feel like mm -hmm. it, I, I have great respect, obviously, because I, you know, actors, you're literally putting your body out there and I feel like it, it demands a kind of sacrifice, but I feel like throw yourself into it and then come back and be like, this is what's challenging for me. Great, thank and, you. you know, and sometimes like, this is how you could help me get from this moment to the next can be helpful too. But I feel like questions, reasons why and then that's the last one like maybe this is how this could be helpful great thank you beautiful our next question is from linda mayo linda you are un Ooh. unmuted oh okay thank you hi martin um i just want to say thank you um I actually grew up going to the Ozarks as a kid, and I never met anybody like that when I was there. Um, uh, but I have one question, um, and it's in it's about what is the difference between writing a play and writing for film in terms of the script? Uh, just well, the the biggest thing is is what is unsaid. 
uh, in a in a in a t TV or film script. That like um, that's part of it. So you say two things: what's unsaid, and then I feel like theater. When I'm writing a play, I am constantly thinking about like in the in the expression of the play justifying its need to be a theatrical event so i'm constantly thinking about like what how am i how is the liveness of the audience their physical presence necessary which can feel like a a, a, a unfair burden to put on a, a play because no one ever asks why a movie is made into a movie or a tv show is made into a tv show they just think well this is how the most people can see this thing right but i think that because people don't because a wider uh, audience in the US and in the world doesn't necessarily automatically think to step into a theater, right? It's not like a thing that casually happens for most people. I feel a burden as a playwright to with my plays make a case for why it has to be live so that when someone does step into the theater for maybe the first time or the first time in a long time, they feel like their physical presence was essential and therefore they feel charged in a way that makes them want to come back to the live thing. Um, so that's the one thing from, that's a personal thing for me as a writer. And I think, I think that like everyone, uh, I think not everyone, but a lot of people will encounter as they, if they uh, are going back and forth between playwriting and TV writing uh, or getting into TV writing after, you know, being, while being a playwright is that uh, generally in theater, because language is, is the most, ex is the thing we most control and it's a more, it is visual, but it's also a more oral experience for the audience. Um, it, it is, uh, we have our characters say a lot of things. We have our characters articulate a lot of things. In general, theater characters from, uh, are, are uh, more verbal and more verbally expressive from the exact same world than if you translated that to screen because the images can say so much and the sort of silences and the breath and the way the shot is composed can communicate so much that what would be perfect on a stage, the perfect encapsulation of a feeling state for a character verbally and would make perfect sense within the world of a play would just feel overwrought on a screen. Thank you. Well, thank you. Our next question is from Issa. You are unmuted. Uh, thank you so much for this. I, I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, I was wondering what your self-editing process is like, like before you get notes from anyone else. Like I've written a lot of drafts and I'm just getting started and I know they need work, but I don't really know um, where to go beyond like just instincts and like, I think this should be changed, but like, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, part of it is just, um, learn like as you learn your craft right like learning just different different signposts for how to communicate certain things and I think you learn that by collaborating with people right obviously from studying and you know in, in formal or informal settings and then and then collaborating with people so that's part of it but so much of it honestly is uh is getting the thing out and then stepping away right um stepping away and then coming back to it and when I come back to it, this is the thing that takes a lot of time and a lot of concentration. Honestly, I would say meditation too. Like to meditating is, is a very valuable to me as a writer and also just like as a person. But I feel like when you, um, I, so many times in my career as a writer, I have reread something of mine, felt a little pang, a little twinge of doubt or something that I just sort of, skipped over because I wanted the thing to be perfect. I wanted it to be perfect, right? And so I quieted that little like pang only to then in a workshop or, you know, in the writer's room on a TV show or in production for a play or in previews, have someone say that thing and everyone be like, oh, that's right. And be like, ah, oh, I knew it. I felt the pang and I ignored the pang because I didn't want to hear it, right? And I feel like, so really like, writing the thing, setting it aside. And then when you come back to revisiting it, like really making that an intentional act where every time you have a little like flicker of question or doubt or something doesn't sit right with you, jot it down, like record that. And don't be content with yourself until you've engaged with it. 
right? Yeah. Like I think can always be better. I think can always be more specific. Um, you know, I, I, I had a professor in undergrad who said like, we never finish plays, we just abandon them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, you, 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 they can, I think can always be more specific. And so I think that like holding yourself, there's, you have an internal standard, right? You know what you like, you know what grabs you, you know what seizes you, you know what work leaves an indelible mark on you. And so you, and so you can know if you really listen to yourself, listen to your own sort of internal metric of what is good, uh, of what is moving you, you know whether the thing is, is clearing that bar, whether what you're working on is clearing that bar, you know when it's not. Um, but you also have to really listen to all of the flickers of doubt that like can just, they're like little sparks and you have to catch them because if you don't, uh, if you don't catch them as soon as they spark, you're gonna you're gonna convince yourself that the thing is good because you want it to be done, and you, everyone wants to be good, right? Everyone wants the thing that they write to be good. So that that I think is a, is a a big part of it. And and setting it aside, you can't do that while you write, right? Like that's a separate part. So you got to let yourself, you know, write and 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 be present to the, the writing part, and then set it aside and return to it intentionally with like diagnosing what I would say. And then the rewriting is a separate part too. Because you might not have all the answers to those little like flickers of doubt that come up on the rewrite or the, I'm sorry, on the reread. Uh, and so you need to set it aside again and then return to it when you do the rewrite. Thank you. Our next question is from Viviana Cardenas. You are unmuted. Hi, my team. Thank you so much for being here. It's, you know, it's been great learning from you. Um, as a person of color in this climate and in the pandemic climate of our world, do you see yourself um, as a writer changing and growing with every, you know, devastation or new thing that we're facing as, as a country today and as a person of color? How do you feel about that? I, that's a very hard question to answer. Um, I feel like I don't, I don't know. I feel like it's very early to be able to say. I feel like I, I am constantly thinking about um, how we are all, well not all, obviously people are having very different experiences of quarantine or of the pandemic because a lot of people cannot quarantine. Um, but I feel like we're in a very odd space because uh, a lot of people who are fortunate enough to be able to quarantine in their homes uh, are, we are sort of going through this experience where it is both, we are isolated from each other and yet it is, there are certain parts of it that we share and yet at the same time knowing that like our isolation from each other is, is essential to make sure that the devastation that a lot of people are feeling is, is can at least be uh, mitigated and less acute for people who, who have no choice but to face it. So I feel like, uh, but I kind of feel powerless in many ways to, to, to really do much. So I, 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 I don't know that I feel like I'm growing as, an, as, a, as a writer because of it, other than just like hopefully that by thinking about um, the things that people are going through that I know that my actions have an impact on even though I cannot see those things, right? Like thinking about like what a hospital is like and my staying inside will prevent uh, people from who, whose lives are chaotic and messy and terrifying in a hospital right now, uh, who I will never see, I will never see that experience. I will never access it, but my actions have an indirect effect on it. So I think hopefully like just a greater consciousness in general about how actions we take indirectly affect other people's lives for the better and worse in very, very concrete ways. And, and hopefully that makes me a more conscientious person. And obviously I think that, and in your question about like being a writer, I think that being a more conscientious person, hopefully is, is reflected in, in also writing because if we're trying to sort of, as writers capture the experiences of people both like us and not like us and try to sort of walk through the paces of their lives with them with integrity, uh, trying to be aware of, of how our lives affect the lives of people who we don't ever overlap with is very, is essential. 
No, definitely. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, we're coming up. I think we have time for uh, one or two more questions. Uh, if anybody wants to toss them in the chat or raise their hand. Uh, while we're waiting, I am curious if you have any tips on how to use a whiteboard, uh, what your <laughs> best whiteboard techniques are. You know, I'm, uh, I'm not like the greatest, uh, you know, I would say handwriting is, is, I think sadly what happens in a lot of writer's rooms is the person who has the best handwriting uh, ends up sadly being the one who gets the task of, of being the one who writes everything on the whiteboard. So <laughs> my tip would be to, to avoid being that person. Don't let people know if you have their handwriting. <laughs> on Narcos are the, the, the guy who ended up writing a lot of the stuff on the whiteboard, he had gotten his, his one of his first jobs in Los Angeles was writing the cue cards, I think for Leno. So like, he, and apparently Leno had like very specific, like if it wasn't written a certain way, it got thrown out and rewritten. So. You know, unfortunately, he always was the one writing at the board. So I, I, I don't know that I have tips on how to be using it well. Um, I, I, guess, I, guess I would say whatever you use, whether it's a whiteboard or not, just like find a way to, uh, to uh, record your thoughts and catalog them. That's what the, the whiteboard is. Whether you do it with like Google Docs or in a journal that you tag different things like I do, find a way to record and index your thoughts so you can reaccess them and revisit them. Awesome. I, I do not have good handwriting, but I do have a large whiteboard that's just been sitting around and I keep eyeing it going like, I know this is useful, probably. I think the visual like, reference, having it in the space yeah. where you can re-encounter your ideas after you've forgotten them is useful. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Re-encountering. All right. It looks like we have one more raised hand. Isa, you are unmuted. Hi again. Um, I, I'm also bilingual and I was wondering how your writing shifts based on the language you're using. I've kind of done more writing in English. I've done a little bit in Spanish. Um, I'm most comfortable in like Spanglish, like just combining, um, but how you, how your process might change or if it does at all um, and just what that's like. Uh, I think generally uh, because obviously I've written plays that sort of go back and forth um and and like I, i've had to think about the logic you have to think about like is your who is your audience is your audience primarily in one language or another and then like what is the logic about shifting into the it, it's rare that you see the play that's like 50 50 is what i'm saying um so it's like if you're writing for a primarily spanish-speaking audience and you have characters who communicate in both languages What's the logic by which they would switch into English? What are you trying to say with that? And vice versa. It's something that I had to think a lot about with the uh, Seven Spots in the Sun. Um, how do you communicate? Because uh, you know most of the audiences in the United States obviously are predominantly uh, uh, English-speaking audiences, even if there are uh, Latinx audiences in the United States. And yet, that is a play that is set in a country in Latin America where the characters' first language, they're you know, and for many of them, their only language is Spanish. So how do you how do you create, convey that environment, but also, and, um, and also, you know, for an English language audience. So that's something like, what's the logic of how they shift? Uh, if, if that's just how you naturally communicate and that's how you speak, I mean, that I feel like you can obviously speak to the, the, the integrity of your own experience and how you communicate. Um, in in the TV, it, it's different in the sense that obviously uh, everything can be subtitled. A lot of things get dubbed whether you, you know, um, so, uh, so you're not thinking about like so much, I haven't, I haven't had the experience of so much switching languages because I've written usually things with characters who speak one language or the other, but the process in terms of generating story to me isn't, isn't different because TV is so structural. There's so many distinct scenes and there's so many distinct story points that it's so structural and it's so visual that to me, the, the, pro the, the, the process doesn't feel that different. And I, you might be surprised. I think that a lot of um, a lot of writers in TV also, because there is the sort of within the, the the capacity of shows and studios to translate from one language to another. A lot of the scripts that you see in one language, the writer might actually the original writer might have written them in a different language. Cool. Thank you so much. Beautiful. We are at one oh one. Do you have time for one more question, Martin? Sure. Beautiful. 
All right, Isabel, you are unmuted. Here. I just had uh, one more question come up when you were talking about some other stuff, which is um, kind of a, about writing for people who are close to the experience that you know, and also writing for people that are have totally different experiences you than you, and wanting to both like be responsible in the stories you're telling and the representation that you're putting out there with the stories that you're telling, while also staying true to your own experiences and um, not like stepping on other people's experiences and just the kind of line that comes with navigating that? Yeah, that's a great question. Cause I feel like, as, as I said, like I'll, I'll kind of feeling like I'm outside of every experience, I for better or for worse kind of always feel that way. It's always scary to me. Uh, and so first of all, I would say it's okay to be scared and it's good to be scared. Like I think if you're not scared about writing someone else's experience there's a problem, right? Like you should be scared. Um, and I think what, what you should do first, I think you need to embrace the fear and um, use it to sort of fuel research, talking to people, reading things. And then also understand that like, um, even inside, uh, like even when you're writing about, no experience is uniform right? No experience of, of, of a neighborhood, of what it's like to live on a block, of what it's like to, to be from a, a country is uniform in any way, right? So what you, I think your job as a researcher is to be specific, to get into the specificity of your character's experience and remember that like a character, a character both is formed by their social context and also like they have an individuality that, uh, that they bring to that context. And so to remember like they're, they're people, they're, you know, the person whose experience is outside of my own is a person and a person in a context. So I think that what I always try to like start by thinking about like the, how they're formed by their closest relationships and the integrity of that. And then how that intersects with the particular context. Um, and, and so to remember like the person and the context too, and the specificity of the context and to remember when I say that like the, the experience of, a, of a living in a neighborhood, a block, uh, a state, a city, a country is not uniform to remember that like, you're probably gonna get uh, no matter what you write about, even if it's a thing you know about deeply and intimately from personal experience, you're gonna get, if you're lucky to have your work seen by a lot of people, different people who come up to you and they're like, that is exactly how it is. And then someone else will come up and be like, you don't know anything about that thing. Um, you know, but to remember that you, you are, you need to set your own internal bar for, for how rigorous your research is. And so to, it's okay to be afraid and you should be afraid and to embrace that. Ooh, thank you, Isa. Thank you. Ah, I think we're, I think we've reached the end of the road. <laughs> Martin, thank you for joining us today. This was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for the great question. Wh where, uh, can you tell us where people can stalk you? Uh, they can stalk me. Uh, I mean, I and have a website. website that's pretty, it's a little out of date. I need to work on it. <laughs> um, but, but they can stalk me there. They can. Um, you can watch Ozark. You can watch Ozark. You can watch Puerta Siete um on netflix you can yeah those are those are the the best places and then obviously like you know theater stuff i'm still i would say my upcoming project that it says on my website for theater are all sort of upcoming i can't really talk about that them in that much detail um i had a, a the play that the thought that you and i workshopped is, is was supposed to premiere at uh hartford stage um yeah. In, in September, obviously that's going to be delayed. I don't know at what sure. point it will get rescheduled, but you know, as soon as that's up there, I'll, you know, I can get information on. Oh, and my uh, play on the exhale. Uh, there's both a recording of it on Broadway HD that you could watch. Oh, great! Uh, lovely performance by Marin Ireland. Really lovely performance. And then uh, there's an audio version on Audible too. So that's another cool. place that you can uh, encounter. And of course, there's me. publications of your of your play. Yes, and there's publications of Seven Spots in the Sun on the exhale. Which uh, oh, everybody, everybody, yes, everybody has to read that play. Seven spots, please. <laughs> oh, and White Type Ball is published too. 
Ah, uh, okay. I believe, I think, hold on, now, now it's, I'm pretty, okay, now I'm sorry. <laughs> Definitely some of us on the sun and on the edge. It's so, okay. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but no, it's no, good no, to see. Right. I just, I was trying to remember, I was like, wait, yes, I think it was, but. Right. Definitely seven spots on the um, and on the X. Right. Well, it's good to see you again. If I'm in Chicago to see family, of course I'll hit you up. Yes, and please do. Give my best to to Kelly and stay safe. And thank you. Uh, and everyone, please stay been, safe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll we'll have to bring you back to Pittsburgh and take yeah. you back to the aviary or something. Yeah. <laughs> Loved it. All right. Uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Thea. Thank you. Take us out. Thanks everybody. We will see you on Monday. For Herbert. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Herbert Siguenza. See you Monday, <laughs> folks.